Hi, welcome to the Healthy Perspective Show with Stephen Horn. Thanks to everybody who joined us today. We are going to continue from the last uh, show we did uh, on our discussion about uh, uh, canna cannabis, cannabinoids, and so forth. But I'm going to actually take a detour on this because um, uh, THC, which is the uh, psychoactive component, the thing that's found in marijuana. Um, uh, it, it's important to understand this whole idea of mind-altering substances because um, phytocannabinoids um, are dealing with the body's chemical messaging systems. And there's a lot of things that deal with the body's chemical messaging systems. And we, if you understand a little bit about the body's chemical messaging systems and the history of our uh, using substances to uh, alter them, it gives us some perspective on understanding uh, the use of cannabis. So I'm starting off with something from Alice in Wonderland where the caterpillar uh, asks Alice, who are you? And Alice replied rather shyly, I, I hardly know, sir, just at present. At least I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have changed several times since that. And understanding who we are is, you know, a really important question. What are we? Um, the webinar I'm doing, two-part webinar I'm doing in December, a holistic uh, approach to disease. I'm, I'm going to address this in great detail, but I want to briefly talk about it right here. The, the prevailing viewpoint in medicine and modern science is that the material world is all that there is, and that, that everything in creation is a result of random chance processes. And uh, when it comes to medicine and chemical messengers, then the, the prevailing notion is that the uh, chemical messengers are what are giving rise to consciousness. That is, consciousness is the bioelectrical activity in our brain. Uh, the neurotransmitters, the chemicals, the hormones, the electrical signaling processes, that's all consciousness is. Now, I would beg to differ, and, and not just because I'm a person of faith, that I have a belief in God and, and a religious belief, but, all, but also because from a very pragmatic standpoint, there's some problems with this viewpoint. Um, and the first one is you have a steady flow of dialogue and thoughts, words going on in your brain all the time. Everybody does all this mental, constant mental chatter. Now, the question I want is, who is listening to the mental chatter? Because you're observing the mental chatter, right? So are you the mental chatter? Or are you the person who is, or the entity, or the consciousness, or the soul, or the spirit, or whatever you want to call it, that is listening to the mental chatter in your brain? So... Modern science would say, no, that's just the biochemical processes, you know, firing off in your brain, blah, 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 blah. And so the idea of mind and brain are one. And therefore, if I'm having, you know, problems with weird thinking, a mental illness, or I'm having problems with, with uh, emotional issues such as depression or anxiety or, or so forth, the, the answer is going to be, to fix the chemical messengers because if I fix the chemical messengers then my consciousness will change because my consciousness is just coming from the chemical messengers well um, so with that in mind let's talk about a common substance that just about everybody in this country uses I actually never used it much until I was in my 40s um, and even now I I, I uh, I'm getting where I just want to avoid it for, for multiple reasons, but that's caffeine. I'm talking about, you know, cola drinks and uh, uh, so-called energy drinks and, uh, and coffee and so forth, uh, plus quite a number of other herbs uh, contain it, yerba mate and so forth. Now, how does caffeine work? The common prevailing thing is caffeine gives you energy. Well, not really, okay? If you understand the, the idea of chemical messaging systems, then... Neur uh, cells talk to each other by releasing chemicals that go to the next nearby cells and 
uh, or through the bloodstream in the case of hormones and attach to receptor sites on other cells that then stimulate them to do different things. So you have a neurotransmitter called adenosine that's released by certain neurons in your brain to tell you that you're tired. Um, ca caffeine binds to the receptor site for that neurotransmitter and blocks it. It acts as an antagonist. Um, if it was an agonist, it would make the receptor site more active, thereby triggering greater, a greater sense of fatigue. It, but since it's an antagonist, it does the opposite. It binds to the receptor site, locks it up, and prevents the signal from getting through that you're tired. So because you're still pushing forward, when you're tired, your body goes, oh, okay, we need more energy. So it turns on the fight or flight response by activating the, the stress system in your body, increasing your level of cortisol and epinephrine to keep you active. Now, that right there, in a nutshell, is the whole issue with uh, when, we, when we take things that are in, interfering with our, our body chemical messaging systems. You're, the, the body's trying to communicate to you that you're tired, that you need sleep, you're blocking the signal so that you don't feel sleepy. And then that's putting a stress on your body that your body then readjusts your homeostasis to make up for. But now here's the interesting thing. If, if chemical messengers are responsible for everything in consciousness, then how come the body adapts? How come the body is intelligent enough to know that you're doing this understand that it needs rest and override the caffeine by building more adenosine receptors to get the message through that you're tired because that's what happens. So what happens over time if you drink coffee like every day is your homeostasis adapts to the coffee. So it, it builds extra adenosine receptors so that all the coffee is doing now is preventing you from feeling more tired because if you don't have the coffee then you've introduced another uh, perturbation into the homeostasis of the body and now there are more adenosine receptors than are needed so you're going to feel tired and sleepy and you might have a little bit of a headache or, or other kinds of symptoms of what we call withdrawal. Well withdrawal is nothing more than the body then trying to reseek a new found homeostasis because it's built up a tolerance to the caffeine and now as you come off the caffeine it has to undo what it did to create the tolerance that's withdrawal and really that's what addiction is all about is the body adjusts to the presence of the substance that you're addicted to creates a newfound homeostasis and then when you withdraw it has to re go through a rigorous process of rebalancing homeostasis so there's some intelligence in the body that's able to override the biochemistry. And that's also true in, in looking really at the mind in general. You know, modern science, again, is promoting the idea that ideas and thoughts and emotions are the result of brain activity, and there's no mind or soul or spirit, only the body. Now, but if that's the case, then how come it is you decide to do something, all right, that... Um, like uh, you're going to learn a new skill and your brain literally changes its structure, builds new neural connections and everything and alters its biochemistry in order to do what you want. And, and so people who are researching this are saying, if the brain is causing the phenomenon of the mind, then how come changing your mind changes your brain, right? Because the, the, it would imply that there's a causal factor outside of your brain for your mind. In fact, there are, are several basic flaws in that mechanistic model of mind and brain. The, the first one is the one I've already pointed out, that changing one's thoughts alters brain chemistry and affects brain structure. So. A person can be depressed and they can take a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
and they might not feel depressed, but they could also go get counseling and, uh, and change their thinking and behavior patterns, and that will alter their brain chemistry uh, much like the drug, and then they're not depressed too. Now, one of the things really interesting is after mapping the human brain, and they have done a really thorough job of mapping the human brain, they cannot find any part of the human brain that makes decisions. The, the decision-making process area of the brain cannot be located, which implies that it's not the brain making decisions. And also, there is no part of the brain that they can find that integrates perceptions, that is, that, that ties all of the information from your eyes and your ears and your senses and your nerves and everything together into a cohesive picture of the world. So I would propose to you that we do have a consciousness that resides outside of the physical experience of the brain. And because of that, um, I like to think of the essence of who you are as being the programmer and the brain is a computer that you're programming, and that computer runs your body, which you're operating, okay? So the brain is a tool used by the mind rather than being the source of the mind. And so as you make decisions to think certain ways or develop certain skills or abilities by, by uh, habitually doing this, like, I mean, just going back to being a child, when you learned to walk, you didn't know to walk, you saw other people walking, so you got up and tried and tried and tried and tried and tried, and eventually your brain created neurological connections to be able to control your body, and all of a sudden that becomes on autopilot, and then you don't have to think about walking anymore. So you've developed, you've turned it into a skill. So the brain literally formed the programming network to, for you to be able to do that without conscious thought. Um, and so there's a book here called You Are Not Your Brain by a medical doctor who studied this extensively. And he says that there's evidence that chronic anxiety, depression, other negative mental and emotional issues may be programs or fear or defeat that have been created. In other words, past experience, past thinking, past whatever has created programs that are running on autopilot in the brain, just like your ability to walk runs on autopilot in your brain. And that but that you can alter those programs. That is, um, there, there's evidence also for this thing called neuroplasticity, where if you have a stroke that destroys part of the brain, say that you, that, that you use for walking, then you literally can relearn to walk and your brain will make new wirings in other part of the brain to be able to take over the ability to walk. So you can, you can create new neurocircuitry through your feedback. So, Besides neurotransmitters and hormones and other and, uh, endocannabinoids and other things being used to um, uh, create messages that to allow the body to talk to it, you know, cells in the body to talk to each other to maintain homeostasis, to try to keep the body in a balanced state of function, these uh, messenger chemicals also give us feelings or sensations that that basically is the body feeding back to us. So like if you have a car and you're the driver, all right, you're not the car, but you get behind it and the car almost becomes an extension of you as you're driving down the road, which is why if someone cuts cuts off in your car, you you experience it like a personal insult, you know, or whatever and get upset. But your car gives you feedback about how it's performing. And so we we get the feedback from the body in the forms of sensation. So there are neurotransmitters or chemicals that fire off that give us sensations of pain or pleasure or hunger or thirst or fatigue or restlessness. Fatigue meaning we need to sleep, restless meaning we need to get busy and do something, go out and get physically active, um, anxiety and irritability, discomfort or well-being. So that's all communicating. So here we are, if, if, you, if you follow my uh, train of thought here, that your soul, your spirit, your consciousness is inhabiting this body and operating it as a tool in order to, you know, uh, be on this plane of existence. Well, that body is also a bio biological machine that is giving you feedback in the form of feelings and sensations about how well you're operating everything. And so what we tend to do is we tend to think that of, of these 
feelings or sensations as they're the problem, like the anxiety is the problem, the, the, the thirst is the problem, the restlessness is the problem, the sense of discomfort or pain is the problem, when these things in reality are trying to communicate something to us. And that's been the primary thing I've been trying to teach people in emotional healing work is your feelings are trying to communicate to something to you. And if you don't understand what they're trying to communicate, you can't fix them. And the reason why you, you get stuck in depression or anxiety or fear or whatever is because you don't really know what is being communicated to you. If you understood what was being communicated to you, you would be able to fix it. But what you've done is you've created thought processes around that that are not accurate. And so you perpetuate because, because you cannot make the changes that res respond to the messages. I mean, like that would be like, okay, you're hungry, so you're gonna sleep. Well, that doesn't solve the problem. Or, or you're thirsty, so you're gonna eat. You know, a lot of us are, are so out of touch with the body, so out of touch with our own inner sense of knowing that we totally cannot read the signals coming from our own body anymore. So let's talk about this going to opium. So the opium poppy is a, a medicinal plant. I mean, it has been used for over 3,000 years to relieve pain. Nobody knew why. We never knew why it relieved pain. But finally, in the early 1800s, someone isolated an alkaloid from it called morphine, which he found out had a very strong analgesic and sleep-inducing effect. Okay, Turns out there's a whole bunch of alkaloids that work together within the opium uh, plant. But it wasn't until 1970 that Dr. Kandras Perk, who wrote the book Molecules of Emotion, uh, working with another neuroscientist, discovered the receptor that 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 was there to um, re, that the morphine and other similar alkaloids attached to in the brain that that caused the pain to cease and this feeling of well-being or euphoria to to occur. And so Candace Perk is reported to have said, "Okay, God presumably did not put an opiate receptor in our brains so we could discover how to get high on opium." Well, the real reason we have opioid receptors is because there's a chemical messaging system in the brain that is used to produce a feeling of well-being, okay? And um, that's done through what are called endogenous opioids, uh, which include dynorphins, uncalphins, endorphins, endomorphins, and no uh, septin. So basically, there's these different chemo uh, neurons that use these neurotransmitters to communicate things that say, get, ah, you know, I, I feel good, right? Um, and so the endorphins, I, which is short for endogenous morphine, okay? And, and, and I'm put pointing this out because it's very similar to this thing of what we find of can cannabis, you know? People knew that cannabis produced these effects, but no one knew why until they started investigating it. And then they found the cannabinoid receptors, and they found this whole cannabinoid system in our bodies. But the cannabinoid system doesn't exist because of the plant cannabis any more than the um, opioid receptors exist because of the, um, of the opium poppy, okay? It's because we have endogenous cannabinoids, all right? And these are released during things like uh, when, we, when we exercise. So what we call the runner's high, when you, when you go out and you, and you get physically active and which is good for your body, right? Your body gives you a feeling of the runner's high. It says, you're doing a good thing for yourself, right? Uh, it also does that when you're making love to your partner. It says, this is a good thing. You feel good, okay? I don't know why it does it with spicy foods, but maybe spices are good for us. But it also helps to alleviate pain, all right? So you can get a massage and it releases endorphins and it helps you feel good it says that was good for you or you, you can meditate if you meditate you get a release of endorphins which suggests okay meditation is a good thing to do because it in, induces feel good feedback from the the body saying you're doing this now now the problem with 
opioid addiction is, is that, yeah, people, so people are in pain, so we use opioids to relieve the pain, but then the body adjusts to the presence of the opioids, is no longer responding to the internal signals of well-being, and the person gets into the same kind of thing with caffeine, only it's much worse. By the way, chocolate also has a mild uh, increasing effect on endorphins. So in, in the plant world, all right, it, and, and as well as in the um, um, uh, drug world, okay, you you can affect the body's biochemical messaging systems in numerous ways, okay? So you can stimulate more of the messaging chemical to be released. You can inhibit the messaging chemical from being released. You can inhibit production of the mess messenger chemical by inhibiting the enzymes that produce it. You can also inhibit the enzymes that break down the chemical messenger, which causes it to remain longer and therefore have uh, more activity. Um, uh, then you can also block the chemical messenger reuptake. That's what SSRIs do. And you, can, uh, and you can also have something that mimics the chemical messenger, which is what morphine does with opioid receptors and caffeine does with adenosine receptors that either that binds to a receptor site in the body and either does what the, the endogenous chemical does that stimulates that receptor site or it blocks that receptor site. So lobulin in lobelia, for example, ha binds to what are called nicotinic receptors. So here, here it's funny. You, they're nicotine, right? The, the receptor is named for nicotine, like the op opioid receptors are named for opium. All right? That's, it's because it was studying the effect of these compounds in plants that we discovered these um, receptors. And so it's... It, it, it acknowledged our way of body understanding. So I just put this little chart. I built this years ago. It's very simplistic, but basically you have a neurotransmitter being released. It goes over to a receptor site and binds to it to stimulate it. Or you can have a drug or herb that mimics it and binds to it, either blocking it or enhancing it. You can inhibit the enzymatic uh, breakdown. Uh, you can block reuptake. Um, you can uh, affect synthesis. Now, here's what's interesting, and I, we're going to get into this a little bit. And it, most plants that have any effect on this work on multiple layers of this. And I think that's what's, what's amazing about plant medicine versus orthodox medicine. But coming back to, I just want to go through one more example of this before um, I get into talking a little bit about cannabinoids and, and why it's important that we use them intelligently. Okay, so serotonin. When I first heard of this stuff, I thought, okay, that serotonin is like this chemical released in the brain, and then it, it goes through the brain and does this. No, actually, neurotransmitters are released specifically from one neuron to the next neuron. So what you have is you have parts of the brain that contain certain kinds of specialized neurons that release chemicals to talk to other nerve cells or other cells in the body, you by the by means of the neurotransmitters and so looking at the part of the brain that is involved with a particular neurotransmitter uh, tells a lot about what this is for and you you look at the neurotransmitters for serotonin they are at the base of the brain and the top of the spinal column and what they are doing is they are connecting the body to the brain so they're 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 sending signals down into the body and they're also sending projecting signals up into the brain and so this is affecting the sleep-wake cycle, the, the ability to, to experience pain. Um, it also has to do with motivation, being alert, and a, and a bunch of other functions. But interestingly enough, and I'm going to pull my webcam on, um, they're really associated with the whole idea of motivation and self-esteem high activity of the serotonin neurons. In other words, the serotonin neurons are very active, helps you have very strong willpower. You have a very strong connection to your body and to, or, to reality, and it helps you delay gratification and make plans and act on those plans. But if it goes too high, it leads you to be aggressive, violent, hostile, you know, because you're over-asserting yourself, okay? Whereas low activity, 
makes you unmotivated. You have a hard time finishing things. You feel depressed or discouraged. You're more easily annoyed. You'll have a hard time controlling your impulses and your thought processes are very ungrounded. Now, here's an interesting thing, okay? Remember, this stuff is located here at the base of your brain. So, you know, if you ever notice somebody who's discouraged and depressed, what do they do? They hang their head. Well, there's this concept, you know, in Chinese medicine of sagging chi, the whole central meridian running up the front of the body it just sags and you go, mm. you're like this, you know, walking around the cloud on your shoulders. Well, interesting, they've actually done studies and proven that if you throw your shoulders back, stand up straight, and hold up your head high, you immediately upregulate serotonin neurons. Now, isn't that interesting? In other words, behavior, the, the, the decision in your mind or your consciousness to alter your behavior alters those neurons. If, if you sit down and you start making plans for your life and you start looking at your problems and you start figuring out things you're going to do to solve them and you start doing them, you will upregulate your serotonin neurons. All right. Now, if you're a person who is, you know, feels like I can't do anything, I'm not important, I blah, 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 you've been led to believe that you're, that you're stupid and incapable and whatever, yeah, you're going to get depressed. You're going to have low serotonin function because you can't assert yourself, you can't delay gratification, you can't go after the things you want, right? So do you, do you work with the behavior or do you change the thing? Now, it's interesting that LSD uh, binds to serotonin receptors and slows them down, which basically ungrounds you from the body and causes hallucination. And by the way, the serotonin neurons shut down when you dream and also ergot fungus and uh, other chemical from mushrooms have... Uh, similar effects in basically slowing down serotonin, which is disconnecting you from reality. Now, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and other serotonin modulators, we, there's all these drugs that modulate serotonin because why? Because the medical profession believes that your, your depression is caused by the biochemistry. All right, so if the, since the mind is arising from the the electrical chemical activity of the brain, we modify the electrical chemical activity of the brain, we fix the problem. I would propose that if you viewpoint from the way I do, it's the other way around. Your thinking, your choices of behavior, the things that you have done are basically creating an imbalance in your body and your body is giving you feedback that's saying this is not working for you. And if you turn around and recognize that message that, that life isn't working for you and you make some determination to start changing it, that that will do the same thing and it'll be a healthier way to do that. Now, um, and this is just something I don't want to go over, spend a lot of time with, but if you elevate serotonin too much, it can cause psychosis and mania and uh, can contribute to a bunch of other, other problems. And if you reduce serotonin metabolism, that is you block reuptake, you block the enzymes that break it down, it's in, it's, there's an increased risk of suicide. There's an increased risk of violent crime. My friend who has done a lot of research on this basically says that almost all mass shootings involve people on uh, drugs that are modulating serotonin. Well, think about this, okay? So you don't feel good about yourself. You don't know how to behave in a way that makes you feel good about yourself. Now you start taking something that upregulates serotonin, so you start feeling, you know, powerful and whatever, and other people aren't respecting you, and and so you act out maybe in a in an inappropriate way. There's greater arguments with spouses, more hostile behavior, more more reckless, uh, so forth. So, I'm and I'm pointing this out to say that when we tamper with the body's messaging systems, we're always creating. We're perturbing the system. And as we perturb the system, everything is interconnected to everything else. And the body has to reassert its equilibrium. And so now, so the, the balance of life is dynamic, not static. Now, here's why we'll lecture on herbs versus drugs, okay? If you take any medicinal plant, okay, any, any, any herb that we use medicinally, it contains thousands of chemical compounds. It, can, it not only does it contain chemical compounds that may act on the body in different ways, but it also contains vitamins, minerals, various nutrients that plants, plants need. And 
there's a synergy there that yeah, is different. Like, you know, uh, well, people talk about like uh, St. John's wort for depression because some, you know, some studies did that and found that St. John's wort was helpful for mild to moderate depression. But St. John's wort isn't just a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It actually has multiple compounds that act on multiple different systems in the body, which basically are, in my point of view, tweaking the body back towards homeostasis. And since the plant is also a living thing with a, with a life energy of its own, I like the way Matthew Wood thinks about it. The plant almost teaches us how to restore equilibrium inside of us. It guides us in the process. Now, I, ideally, what I, I like to do, and uh, this is what I'm talking about in my webinar, a Holistic Approach to Disease, is I like to say, okay, you're depressed. Let's tweak your homeostasis. We'll find some things to help kind of rebalance your body uh, biochemically while we work on helping you, uh, you know, identify what's making you depressed, what's defeating you in life, how we can help you overcome it, blah, blah, blah. Because if I can help tweak the person to start to feel a little better, and I can then encourage them to modify their thinking, their behavior, uh, do better health habits, look at their life and so forth, so that they take control of their life, then we work towards a permanent solution. The, the biggest complaint I have about modern medicine is, that, is the, the symptomatic nature of it. The, the, the symptom relieving nature of it, that it, it tries to target one specific little biochemical aspect, which means it's targeting some kind of chemical messaging system in the body, making a specific change to one thing. And now that make, because that one change, which seems like, oh, that ought to fix things, because it's disturbing the entire equilibrium of the body, the body has to find a new homeostasis and adapt to it. And often in the process of adapting to it, it produces other imbalances that then the medical doctors treat with other drugs. But they're never looking at things like, what is the person eating? They're not looking at what kinds of uh, stress is the person under. Are they having family? You know, you know how many times I've been talking to someone and they've got health problems and as I'm seeing them, they're, they're having struggles in their marriage. They're having struggles with their kids. They're having struggles at work. They're having, they're having problems in their life. And often between those problems and maybe the fact that they aren't taking good care of themselves, they're not getting the sleep they need, they're not getting the exercise they need, they're not eating healthy or whatever, the combination of those two things together is what's throwing their body out of equilibrium, destroying their homeostasis, and thereby making them sick. And so if I encourage some better behaviors on the one hand, okay, while at the same time I kind of help them, you know, I, I, I act, I, I can't tell you many times I've acted as marriage counselor, parental counselor, career counselor, etc. I, I, I've taken a lot of time to study about uh, relationships. In fact, in my other thing, the healthy perspective, I just did a whole series of things on male female relations. I've done some stuff on parenting. I've done some stuff on a lot of things because I actually wind up sometimes teaching people relationship skills or whatever, or, or goal setting skills or working with other things to help them so that as they're adopting better habits and bringing their body into better homeostatic balance, they're also making better lifestyle choices. And it's the, the two of those things together. And I think that herbs, um, even more than nutritional supplements, help that process. Um, that's why I, I love Matthew Wood's book, Seven Herbs, Plants as Teachers, where he basically implies that, that plants act as teachers, um, like the whole idea of flower essences, of helping to, to uh, open up one's consciousness to, to see something different and start making different choices. That's, that's a huge part of the healing process. Now, all this is, leads up to um, the idea that if we're going to use anything, including cannabis, it's important that the, the, my biggest fear with the whole CBD thing is this, is it's the latest craze. I have been in this for 30 years. I have been through every craze and fad and everything. You know, it goes from, you know, 
fat and protein is bad, to carbohydrates are bad, to this herb is the new miracle herb, to that herb is the new miracle herb, this other herb is the new miracle herb, and now CBD is the new miracle herb, okay? Uh, and, and I know, <laughs> I say this is, I think this is real, what I'm hoping is that the, the idea of cannabis, medical marijuana, and especially hemp, with uh, CBD hemp that doesn't have a lot of THC in it, is going to not be a gateway drug, but a gateway herb. What I'm hoping is that it will wake more people up to the fact that, you know, plants can be very powerful in aiding the healing process. But you can't, okay, let's suppose you're in pain. I mean, one thing that um, cannabis is really good at is helping to relieve pain. But pain is a message something is wrong. And I don't care whether you're using an herb or whether you're using a drug to relieve pain. If you are not identifying what is going wrong in the body and trying to fix it, the pain will come back because you're not addressing the root cause. And it doesn't matter whether you're using herbs or you're using drugs. It, what The allopathic approach is I treat the symptom, make the pain go away, boom, problem solved. But why was the pain there in the first place? Is, is you know, and this is where I think a lot of people get into trouble. All right. Now, I, I mentioned in my article that I wrote online, and I also mentioned it, uh, I think, in the first webinar I did, that after I tried, uh, uh, someone used the cannabis to relieve my earache, and then I used um, uh, used a, an extract of it to, to help relieve pain for a little while, I decided, oh, look, look, what, I wanted to see what the effect was if I smoked it. And after I took a few puffs, I was like, so when do I get high? I was expecting some weird thing to happen. And all I felt was kind of like really good, relaxed, like when I meditate. And he said, well, you are high. And I go, well, I don't need this to get this. And, and that was the point. I actually, I actually knew how to get into that state myself whenever I wanted to. I didn't need a plant to help me get there. Do you understand? It's like the opioids, you know? I don't need opioids to, to make me feel, high. I get natural high from life because I know how to do things that make me happy and make my life productive and make me feel good about myself. And I don't need chemicals, including chemicals from plants to do that. And so the goal of natural therapy should be first to supply the body with nutrients or substances missing. So if you're not getting the nutrition you need, you're not gonna be able to be healthy and cannabis isn't gonna fix that. Also, you've got to remove substances from the body that may be harming or interfering with the body, like maybe someone's, you know, abusing some substance, alcohol or tobacco or whatever, or maybe they're just getting exposed to chemicals or pesticides. I, I know one lady was really sick one time and, you know, it was basically her liver. And we found out that she had she had been the, the kid who stood out as the marker for the crop duster plane for her family's farm. She would just stand there at the end of the row to mark where the plane was supposed to fly over and then she'd move down the road. And, and so she was literally, just as a kid, sprayed over and over again with these chemicals. Well, no wonder she has liver problems, okay? So my, my thing is to help detoxify and rebuild her liver, right? But, a lot, but the real understanding of why a person gets sick it gets in talking to them and digging into their history and finding out what happened. And then the last part, which is helping the person mentally and emotionally return to a higher and more natural state of balance. People want to feel good, all right? And if they don't feel good, if they're sad, if they're depressed, if they've had hard, everybody has hard experiences in life. We have setbacks. You know, I know. I've been through a divorce. I've lost children. They've died. I, I've, I've, I've gone bankrupt. I've had many, many challenges in my life, okay? And those challenges, if, if you don't have the skills and the help and the and, and whatever to get through them in a healthy way, then yeah, you may want to do something just to try to numb your pain or avoid or dealing with it. And if you use something like um, cannabis or opiates or caffeine or alcohol or who knows what to just try to run away from the pain, the pain never goes away. That's that's the concern I have with 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 people using cannabis recreationally is it's, it's like, okay, I can understand someone who might want to do that once in a while just 
just for fun or to get high or just like some people enjoy a, a glass of wine with dinner or something in moderation. But I also see people who, you know, become alcoholics, you know, with it. And I, I've seen some people who I, I know personally someone who I knew was was smoking pot to run away from their emotional pain. And I tried very hard to get them to face their emotional pain and deal with it. They didn't. And you should see their life just went. And I don't saying that that marijuana per se was to blame for it, except that the marijuana was being used as a cover up to avoid having to deal with the, the, the pain that person was in that they, they couldn't do. So the endocannabinoid system, which is what we discovered from the research on cannabis. So it's named after cannabis, as well as just like the opiate receptors are named after opium and the nicotine recept nicotinic receptors are named after nicotine. We named them after the plant, okay? But we found the endogenous cannabinoids, uh, and then there's also the phytocannabinoids, right? The ones that are found in plants. And, there, and as I pointed out in my first webinar, we're discovering that there are phytocannabinoids in other medicinal plants. I pointed out that cobalactones have uh, uh, effects on the cannabinoid system, that there is a compound in echinacea that affects the cannabinoid system that acts with the immune system. And echinacea is a good example of plant synergy. It's got stuff that's directly antimicrobial. It inhibits enzyme activity of bacteria that breaks down connective tissue, inhibiting the spread. It has multiple layers of activity. And that's what's beautiful about plants. And I think a whole hemp um, extract with, with multiple uh, phytocannabinoids could definitely be used to nudge the body back to homeostasis because that is the primary purpose of the endocannabinoid system. And I think that's very, very important to understand. What we're understanding about the endocannabinoid system, it is the system that seeks to maintain homeostasis. So, um, just to come back to the webcam for a second, and I'll just I'll just uh, uh, temporarily stop the slide presentation so I could just uh, talk about this. All right. So when you have a stressful event, all right, the the endocannabinoid system kicks in afterwards to try to re-regulate your system to bring the stress level down and restore it back to homeostasis. Okay, makes sense. And so. When you face a stressful event, the, the first time you face, let's say that we're talking about something that isn't life-threatening, but scary for a lot of people, public speaking, okay? I'm not afraid of public speaking because my, my church, you got up and did things when you were really little. So um, I'm gonna take out my glasses for a second. Um, real, really little. So I grew up getting in front of people and I have no fear of getting up in front of an audience. But the first time people get up in front of audience, it's terrifying. So it initiates a fight or flight response. And the endocannabinoid system kicks in to try to restore balance and keep you going with that experience. Well, when you repeat it and you speak again, the endocannabinoid system kicks in faster and re-regulates the thing. And over a period of several times of getting up and speaking in public, basically the system re-regulates itself so it stops reacting that way. And it's the endocannabinoid system that does that. It does a similar thing when you injure yourself and you have pain and inflammation. Pain and inflammation is a natural sequestering action of the body to, uh, I, I like to uh, uh, liken it to the, the police and the fire department and whatever, the emergency people coming into the area where there's been some kind of disaster or crime scene and they cordon off the area and try to keep people out and keep the, people who might be there who might be suspects from fleeing and and see what's done so inflammation triggers immune reactions that bring in white blood cells to check for debris and toxins and other things like that and it slows the spread of a poison if it's there and, and so forth well then part of what kicks the system back to normal is the endocannabinoid system right so because at some point the body has to look at that area and say, okay, we've, we, there's no more problems here. We, we turn off the inflammatory process and we return the system to homeostasis. Well, one thing that happens, and, and, uh, and this is kind of my take of studying this, um, 
of what I believe is going on and why I believe cannabis can be helpful for a lot of very serious chronic conditions is because let's say that you have uh, what we call post-traumatic stress disorder, shell shock, battle fatigue, so forth. What, what, so you, in a war, okay, if you're going to a war and you're, you're constantly under that stress, 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 the body tries to restore equilibrium, but then it's one thing after another, one battle after another, one dangerous thing after another, blah, blah, blah. And pretty soon what happens is your, your system uh, adapts to the stress to the point that when you're not in the stress, you feel stressed. I, I don't know how, how else to explain that. I, I, I had a guy in a men's group suffering from PTSD from Vietnam, and he loved being a firefighter because he loved the feeling of running into the danger and, and, and running up against something. He, he was, he literally had his biochemistry that had been adjusted to the point that, that he, he craved being in the danger. Um, I've talked to people with severe chronic anxiety who, who have this thing where it's like their fight or flight freeze response does not turn off. They're, 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 their whole brain and nervous system is wired towards what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next. And that really contributes to anxiety and depression. In other words, the body's now perpetually thrown out of equilibrium. And, and coming back again to understanding about neurotransmitters, um, I'll give you another example. That, that, that will help you help me illustrate why this is important. Okay, like uh, the reason why like pornography is a problem is because dopamine encourages us, the dopamine neurons encourage us to go after things that are perceived as beneficial for us. So um, if, a, if a guy is looking at girl after girl after girl after girl after girl in sequence, it's triggering over and over and over and over and over and over again the dopamine neurons, and what happens is they actually burn out. The, the amount of dopamine in those neurons gets depleted. By the way, sugar does the same thing. Um, and as you deplete the dopamine neurons, you start to feel unmotivated and depressed because you've overstimulated them. So if, you, if the endocannabinoid system has been repeatedly overridden, 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 then the body equilibrium is thrown out and the endocannabinoid system has lost the ability to adapt. And it seems to me that the conditions that cannabis seems to be most helpful for all involve some kind of really chronic long-term illness that is difficult to budge because the body's so far out of homeostasis that it can't find its way back. And therefore cannabis, uh, the CBD rich hemp, the, the hemp rich in cannabinoids, and maybe in some cases, cannabis that has THC in it, um, will actually act to break through that barrier and nudge the, the body back towards homeostasis. Now, if we couple that with other therapies that we know are going to help, like for example, using it for the anxiety or, or, or depression, and we couple that with good nutrition and we couple that with better lifestyle changes and other things, then that's going to result in a permanent move back to a state of a higher state of equilibrium. That if we're just using it and we're not making the other changes, I see that as problematic. In fact, that's where the recreational use can be problematic because you're flooding your system with the message of go back to equilibrium, everything's okay, go back to equilibrium, everything's okay. And what happens is your own endocannabinoid system stops functioning properly to help nudge you back to homeostasis. And that makes it more and more difficult for you to cope with, with uh, real life if you're doing that obsessively and continually. And that's where I think the, the real uh, you know, problems come in. So I really believe we've got a very useful um, plant here and I've long believed that it was a very useful medicinal plant, but I have really uh, been uh, very opposed to the idea of using it uh, recreationally. Now, just a second, start, there we go.
my uh, there we go. Do, 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 do. My uh, slide presentation didn't come up quite the way I wanted it to. All right. Uh uh. Come on. It's not showing. Come on. Okay, it's not, no, no longer working on the screen. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm just going to have to, uh, turn the, the presentation off. Huh. And it won't go back to full screen either. Hmm. Very strange. Never had that happen before. Okay. Well, so now I'm down. Looks like I'm one tiny little thing down in the corner and my uh, and I, I can't get any slide presentation to come back up. All right. Well, anyway, we'll we'll finish up like this then. So, okay. The in the next presentation I'm going to do on this I'm going to actually talk about some of the research that's been done on the various uh, phytocannabinoids. And what's also interesting is, ta-da, another interesting fact is that terpenes, which are found in a number of different essential oils, interact with the endocannabinoid system, which means that the understanding of the endocannabinoid system is also giving us insights into aromatherapy. Because essential oils then also help to nudge the body back towards homeostasis, which um, you know I've I've used aromatherapy and emotional healing work for a long time, and so that I think that's a very interesting thing to consider. And there's something in cannabis called the entourage effect, which is the idea that the different cannabinoids, in conjunction with the different terpenes, um, have different effects on 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 the body. So there are different cultivars or varieties of cannabis that have more or less of different terpenes or cannabinoids that are more effective at doing some things than others. However, I think a broad spectrum uh, uh, ca uh, hemp cannabis that's high in CBD and also contains other phytocannabinoids can be used as part of, of combined with other herbs and things that we've been doing to bring the body back to homeostasis. And that's you know, I, I've, before all this started happening, I had a friend who was, was working with this in some other state. I always wanted to make herbal formulas that put a little bit of cannabis in them because I always felt that cannabis could act as a catalyst to, especially for things like pain, anxiety, depression, uh, cancer, and so forth, um, to make everything work better. And I, that is my, my belief as to the, the best way to, to use this. So like I said, net, THC is the psychoactive component, um, and I want everybody to understand that the, the cannabis that's legal to grow and use in the entire country right now is cannabis that's low in THC. And when you know cannabis started getting into use for smoking and recreation in the 60s, the amount of THC in most cannabis was quite low, 1% to 2%. Now they have cannabis that's 20 or 30 percent THC, and there are some risks with high THC cannabis. Uh, besides the thing I mentioned of just using it to try to avoid your problems, but especially with young people, I I know my the teenagers in my house uh, uh, think that cannabis is cool and there's nothing wrong with it, but there is some things that, especially if you start smoking at a very early age it increases your risk of uh, schizophrenia and other things. But I think part of that is because anytime you're using a substance just to make you feel good and you're dependent on that substance to make you feel good, instead of finding meaning and purpose in your life that drives you to, to do good in the world, that you're ultimately going to wind up with problems because you're not living your life in a way that's constructive and meaningful. Um, so I, uh, but the, 
the cannabis that's that's legal to use, you know, that's being used in the supplement industry, either has to have less than 0.3% THC, and a lot of it has no THC at all. CBD is the cannabinoid that's being most touted, but there's a bunch of other ones. And the medical profession is just rampant right now, trying to invent drugs that affect the endocannabinoid system, uh, you know, which is exactly what they're always doing, trying to find isolated chemicals to do this. But I would say that our best bet is going to be not trying to focus on CBD, but to focus on actually hemp and uh, low THC cannabis as a tool to help nudge the body back to homeostasis. CBD, unlike THC, does not bind to endocannabinoid receptors. What it does is it modifies the cannabinoid receptors, making them more sensitive to the body's endogenous cannabinoids, which has been shown to not have a tolerance effect because it's not stimulating those receptors. It's restoring their sensitivity so that the body can more easily find its way back to equilibrium. That's why I think it has a, a, a tremendous therapeutic potential in illnesses that are not budget, that are they're difficult to get the body to move back to homeostasis. By, by allowing the, endo, uh, the, the endogenous cannabinoid system to work more efficiently, while you're doing other things to bring the person back to balance, you're going to be able to move them back to balance more, more quickly. Um, so since my slides didn't come up, something stopped working on my webinar thing. I was going to talk a little bit about THC and C CBD, but I am going to next week talk about all the phytocannabinoids and somewhat about the terpenes as well and their effect on the endocannabinoid system. And all of this is stuff that I'm doing in preparation for the book I'm working on, uh, which uh, Kimberly Vallis is now uh, going to co-author me because she has done about, I think she has over 60 studies where she's put put people on different with different problems and added CBD to their protocols. And she's got before and after blood work and she has show, uh, got some interesting things about how CBD affects helping the body get back to homeostasis. So we're, we're gonna be working on um, the protocols of using this along with other things to help people. Uh, so it's used as part of a holistic approach to illness and not as the latest miracle cure all, this will take care of all your problems kind of thing, which just annoys the living daylights out of me in this industry when people go out and do that kind of thing because it gives the whole industry and all of us who are trying to do this legitimately a bad name. Um, now, with that, I want to mention I can't like I can't pull up my slides, but uh, we appreciate your support. If you go to stephenhorn.com and sign up for our newsletter, that uh, uh, check out our website. I've been posting articles. Uh, you can follow me on Facebook. If you don't know where to get CBD and you're interested, you contact me privately. I know a couple of places you can get uh, CBD that I have researched and found out they do very good quality control, and I'm really uh, pleased with them. Um, and, uh, but my purpose here is not so much to sell the CBD because I'm trying to stay more in the uh, uh, educator role of trying to teach people to use things intelligently. Um, you can take it with or without food, um, it, it's fine. Uh, anyway, but thanks to everybody who joined me today. I'm at the end of my time. Uh, if you uh, wanna help financially support us, please join our member program. And also if you like these programs, uh, this will be posted on Facebook. It'll also be posted on my website along with the handouts for the slides. Uh, and so please share this on social media, get the, the word out. And I'll look forward in two weeks to talking to you about the different phytocannabinoids and terpenes and some of the things that they, they do and giving you a little bit more information about how to use this practically. But today my primary goal was just to put this in context of, of understanding what chemical messengers do and understanding that just altering chemical messengers does not fix the problem. Fine, we, we wanna relieve pain, we wanna nudge people back, we wanna help them sleep, we wanna do these things, but we should not just consider our job done if we've given them something to relieve their pain or, or reduce their anxiety and we haven't figured out what got them there in the first place and made sure that they've made the appropriate um, diet, lifestyle, nutrition, mental, emotional attitude changes that are going to keep it from coming back. 
thanks for watching and uh, good night. I mean, good day. <laughs> Have a great day. Bye.